I'm Mark Kansian. I'm the interim director for the Project on Military and Diplomatic History. The project brings uh, distinguished historians to CSIS to talk about their craft um, and the issues that they're working on. And we do this with the hope of uh, expanding the awareness of what's happening in these two uh, areas of history that don't get a lot of uh, attention. Today's event is part of that project. I know many of you have been with us before, and I hope that you will come to uh, our uh, future events also. We'll be uh, running through uh, the spring and into the summer, and I hope also then rolling into next year with our permanent director. Before we begin, I need to make a simple administrative announcement, and that is that in the unlikely event of an emergency, I'll tell you uh, what to do. We'll either stay here or exit through the front or the back door. Well, Max Boot is uh, well known, I think, to many of you. He's a senior fellow uh, in international security at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. He's written extensively on national security topics, and in the last couple of years has written several books about guerrilla warfare and irregular warfare. His most recent book, The uh, Road Not Taken, is a biography of a uni unique American, and he'll tell you uh, all about that, Edward Lansdale, and I mean unique precisely because there's never been anyone like him. He was an Air Force two-star general who never commanded troops. Um, he also represents, as we'll hear, a uh, potential road not taken, not only in the Vietnam War, but then uh, later in our uh, wars in the Middle East. So it's with great pleasure that I turn the floor over to Max Boot and look forward to hearing what he has to say. Great, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, glad you don't discriminate against uh, fellows of rival think tanks. Uh, and it's a uh, delight to be able to uh, speak about my book, which I'm delighted to report is a New York Times bestseller. And I did it even without being denounced by the President of the United States. So all on my own. Uh, uh, let's see now, how the heck do I operate this thing? Let's see, is that, hmm. OK, uh, now I just need to figure out how to actually work this. Uh, anybody here a, a technical expert calling electrical engineering PhDs? And, uh, uh, OK, all right, that seems to work. Good. Well, the subject of my book is, uh, as you surmised, uh, Ed Lansdale, who was certainly one of the most unusual general officers in the history of the US Air Force, or uh, really any other military service. He was somebody who was at one time quite famous. He was said to be the model for both the quiet American and the ugly American. He was written about by pretty much every major author on the subject of the Vietnam War, sometimes in laudatory terms, sometimes not so laudatory. If you go online, you'll even see a burgeoning conspiracy industry that links General Lansdale to the assassination of John F. Kennedy, based pretty much entirely on this one photograph. Uh, which shows somebody from the back, uh, there he is, uh, on November 22, 1963 in Dallas. And if you believe the conspiracy mongers, that person from the back is General Lansdale, and he was in Dallas to coordinate the, the murder of President Kennedy. It seems like rather a thin reed upon which to hang a charge of presidential murder, and yet that was in fact the basis of Oliver Stone's movie JFK. And I was actually debating somebody in Austin a few weeks ago who believes these theories. Uh, so there's a lot of... Uh, legend and a lot of myth around Ed Lansdale. And I would quote to you the words of one of his bureaucratic rivals uh, in the Pentagon, Brute Krulak of the Marine Corps, who said, there are few individuals in my knowledge more damned and at the same time applauded. History is going to have to portray Lansdale's real part. Well, that's where I come in. I am the voice of history in this discussion, having devoted the last five years of my life to studying the life of Ed Lansdale. And so what I'd like to do today is just to present a few of my findings about the man behind the myth, the real Edward Lansdale. For starters, uh, he was a middle class kid. He was not uh, an Ivy League Wall Street kind of guy like so many of the makers of post-war US foreign policy. He was born in Detroit in 1908. This is him in the middle of this photo uh, with his family. Uh, his father uh, was an automotive executive in the early days of the automobile industry and quite a few of his employers ceased to exist while he was working for them. And so they had a very up and down uh, existence. Ed Lansdale spent most of his childhood in California, in LA to be precise, 
and he became a quintessential Californian. Uh, somebody who was very laid back, very mellow, did not like neckties, did not like regimentation. He was kind of a proto Silicon Valley guy long before uh, the existence of Silicon Valley. A couple of other points worth bringing out very briefly about his background. Uh, one is that, well, for starters, he was not a, a good student. I mean, he, his, his life would give inspiration to see students everywhere. Uh, but he was a devoted uh, reader, and he loved reading about the founding. And the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution would become his lodestars as an agent of American power in Asia. Another point very worth making very briefly is he grew up at a time of virulent racism in the 19 teens and 20s, especially against Asian Americans in California. And that was not a sentiment that he ever shared. He actually had some identification with outsiders. Even though he was a white middle class American, he was, his family were also Christian scientists. And that was a very small uh, religion that was looked down upon in his day. And so gave him a, some identification, I think, with outcasts. But for whatever reason, he always treated people of whatever ethnic or racial group as being entirely his equals. And this, too, would become one of the secrets of his success, because he did not condescend uh, to the people that he met in Asia, unlike so many foreigners. Ed Lansdale went to UCLA, uh, dropped out a few credits shy of graduation. And in the early 1930s, at the height of the Great Depression, he moved to New York, hoping to become a New Yorker writer or cartoonist. Like a lot of other people uh, who had these aspirations, he didn't quite make it, and instead went into advertising. And this is Ed Lansdale in his madman days uh, with some of his colleagues at an ad agency in San Francisco in 1940. This is one of the ads that they produced. That's Lansdale up in the corner there. December, December 7th, 1941, uh, the date that will live in infamy, was a, was a day that, that utterly transformed Ed Lansdale's life as it transformed the life of the entire country. Lansdale wanted to get into the war, found it hard to do so uh, because he was over age and had some medical issues that initially prevented the Army from taking him in. So instead of joining the Army, he joined the OSS, America's first civilian intelligence agency. He was not sent abroad. He did not parachute behind enemy lines. He spent his war years stateside interviewing travelers about these strange and wondrous places where Allied troops would shortly be landing from North Africa to the Pacific. And in the process of doing that, he showed himself to be a very good listener, somebody who was very skilled at eliciting information from people. The fall of 1945, as millions of GIs were coming home and the war was ending, found Ed Lansdale going overseas on his first permanent overseas deployment to the Philippines. This was Lansdale. Uh, on this very leaky rice boat that he took to survey some of the newly liberated islands of Japan. He was fascinated by everything he saw about him, whether it was in Japan or principally in the Philippines. He wanted to learn about the folklore, about the economy, about uh, social conditions, uh, geography, everything he could possibly figure out. And he was particularly interested in the Hook Rebellion, H-U-K, this communist insurgency, uh, just beginning in the mid to late 1940s. This is Lansdale here. Uh, with some captured uh, hooks. Now, by the time he got to the Philippines, Lansdale was already married. In 1933, he'd married uh, this woman, Helen, a small town girl from upstate New York, and they had a couple of kids. But when Lansdale arrived in the Philippines, he met this woman, Pat Kelly, a vivacious Filipina, a war widow. Her late husband of Irish Filipino ancestry had died during the war. Uh, she was a single mother. She was uh, working as a journalist, would eventually have a long career working for the U.S. Information Agency in Manila. And uh, Pat Kelly was of interest to Lansdale initially because she was from the same part of Luzon where many of the Hook leaders were from. In fact, she had gone to high school with some of them. And so Lansdale enlisted her uh, as a guide on these very dangerous forays into the backcountry of Luzon to meet these communist rebels. And in the course of these adventures, a friendship developed and before long, a romance. And Pat Kelly became the great love of Ed Lansdale's life, something that was not generally known before I uh, started the research on this book. I was lucky enough uh, to find these. These were the love letters that Ed Lansdale and Pat Kelly shared with one another over the course of many years. I actually tracked down uh, Pat Kelly's granddaughter, who lives in northern Virginia, and went over to her house. And she said, hey, would you be interested in these letters I have in my basement? And I said, boy, would I. Uh, for a biographer, this is a, uh, 
This is like striking gold, an amazing find. And I was also lucky enough uh, to elicit the cooperation of Ed and Helen's boys, uh, Ted and Pete, who are now those boys, of course, now in their 60s and 70s, living in Florida and New York. And they shared with me the letters uh, that uh, Ed Lansdale wrote to their mother, Helen, often simultaneously. And so I'm actually the first person after Ed Lansdale himself to have read both sets of letters, written both to his longtime mistress as well as to his wife. And together they provide this unprecedented vantage point into his innermost thinking that no previous historian or biographer has had. One of the things that emerged very quickly from my research is that Pat Kelly was incredibly important to him, not only personally, although she was very important personally, uh, but also professionally, uh, because she was somebody who provided an entree into Filipino culture in a way that's very hard uh, for outsiders to penetrate. Of course, this also gave me a vantage point onto some of the more awkward episodes in Ed Lansdale's life. For example, what happened in 1947 when his wife, Helen, and boys, Ted and Pete, came to live with him in Manila at the same time that he was still very much seeing and very much in love with Pat Kelly. And juggling these two women uh, would turn out to be one of the more audacious covert actions that this future secret agent uh, <laughs> would undertake. He actually came clean with, uh, with Helen, asked for a divorce. He refused to grant it. Very hard to get a contested divorce in those days, so they stayed married. But he would spend much of the next decade uh, in Asia, and she returned home to Washington and raised the kids essentially as a single mother. Now, this initial tour that Lansdale had in the Philippines from 1945 to 1948 was incredibly important because it set the stage for his later success. And that later success began in 1950 at a very dark time in the history of the United States. This was when the Korean War was raging. Uh, the communists had just taken power in China. The Soviet Union had just acquired an atomic bomb. Uh, the Red Scare was rife in America. And there was real concern that the Philippines was about to be the next country uh, to fall to the communists under this man, Louis Taruk, the leader of the Hooks. Uh, the Pentagon actually drew up plans to send large numbers of U.S. combat troops to the Philippines, but they were never implemented because, of course, every soldier was needed uh, for the Korean War. So instead of sending multiple army divisions, uh, the decision was made to send Ed Lansdale and a small team of covert action operatives, their mission to defeat the Hook Rebellion. This is Ed Lansdale in 1950 or so in his bungalow in Manila. There he is at the head of the table his good friend Robert Chaplin of The New Yorker, uh, his eccentric deputy, the former anthropologist Charles Bo Bohannon, and some of the Filipinos with whom they worked. And this photo is very emblematic of the Lansdale approach. Uh, he did not like formality. He did not like uh, meetings with agendas and Robert's rules of order or what have you. Uh, he liked uh, these very informal coffee glatches, basically kicking back and brainstorming and coming up with the ideas in this way that would defeat the Hook Rebellion. Now, the most important thing that uh, Lansdale did was to befriend this man, Ramon Magsai Sai, uh, who had just been appointed defense minister of the Philippines. He was a former guerrilla fighter against the Japanese, former senator, a charismatic and honest guy who wanted to do the right thing, wanted to defeat the Hook Rebellion, but didn't know how. And that's where Lansdale came in. Lansdale became, in effect, his one-man brain trust. Magsai Sai and Lansdale became very close, as close as brothers. They, in fact, were roommates for a while. They toured the countryside together. And together they came up with the ideas that would one day become known as counterinsurgency doctrine. Lansdale's essential insight was that the way to defeat the Hooks was by using less force rather than more. Uh, he counseled the Filipino army to stop bombarding barrios with artillery because they were killing a lot of innocent people and creating more enemies than they were eliminating. He said they should treat the people as brothers, win their trust and confidence, and then the people would rat out the insurgents in their midst. That is the essence of what would today be called coin or counterinsurgency doctrine. It's, it's conventional wisdom in some circles today. It was, the wisdom was anything but conventional in the early 1950s. Lansdale was one of the pioneers in developing this kind of thinking. Now remember also that he was a former ad man, and so he loved psychological warfare. Uh, the military version of advertising. And he knew a lot about the folklore of the Philippines, and he knew about these legends about the Aswang, uh, these vampires who were said to haunt the countryside. And so he decided to mobilize the Aswang against the hooks. Uh, he did this by having a Filipino army unit take a, a dead hook fighter and put a couple of puncture wounds into his neck uh, 
and then spread the tale that he'd been killed by a vampire. Uh, and this put the fear of the supernatural into the communists. This became part of the Lansdale legend told and retold at CIA headquarters. Can you believe what this guy Lansdale was doing out there in the Philippines? But I don't want to give you the impression that he defeated the Hook Rebellion uh, with dirty tricks or psychological warfare operations. The way he did it was really politics 101. He understood that the Hook's appeal lay in their slogan, which was ballots, uh, sorry, which was bullets, not ballots. Bullets, not ballots. And why bullets, not ballots? Because people did not trust the electoral process. It was all rigged by this corrupt feudal oligarchy that controlled the economic resources of the Philippines. And so Lansdale realized that the first thing he had to do was to instill confidence in the political process, which he did by mobilizing Filipino civic organizations to safeguard the ballot process. But his masterpiece was the election for president in 1953, in which he served as de facto campaign manager for Ramon Magsai Sai. And in case any of you are thinking about running a political campaign in the developing world, I would strongly commend to you uh, this top secret dispatch that Lansdale sent to his boss, CIA Director Alan Dulles, detailing how he won the 1953 presidential election. Uh, and it wasn't anything uh, particularly dirty or underhanded. It was really politics 101, doing things like coming up with a campaign slogan for Ramon Magsai Sai, which, in case you're wondering, was Magsai Sai is my guy. And so Magsai Sai became known as the guy uh, throughout the Philippines. Uh, so with Lansdale's expert political advice and Magsai Sai's own reputation as, a, as an honest and effective reformer, Magsai Sai won a landslide election in 1953, and here he is being sworn in as president of the Philippines. So when Lansdale got back to the United States in 1954, he was very much the flavor of the month at the CIA, and here he is with his boss, CIA Director Alan Dulles. And this became of, of critical importance when that very year, a crisis in another Southeast Asian country was developing. 1954 was the year of the Battle of Dien Bien Phu when the French were losing their hold over Indochina. This, by the way, is a picture that I took at this new museum at Dien Bien Phu, which I would commend anybody who happens to find themselves in uh, northern Vietnam. Uh, but in 1954, uh, this was not a historical curiosity. This was seen as a major security threat to the United States because of the domino theory, uh, this notion that if Indochina went communist, then next would be Thailand and Malaysia, Indochina, pretty soon all of Asia would be under the red banner. And so uh, policymakers in Washington were quite concerned about this. At the Geneva Conference, uh, the international convention split up Vietnam into two, North Vietnam to be ruled by Ho Chi Minh and the communists, South Vietnam uh, to be under a non-communist state. But how would you create this non-communist state where none had ever existed? Well, CIA Director Alan Dulles and his brother, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, got together and decided uh, that the answer lay in sending Ed Lansdale uh, to uh, Vietnam. And by this point, Lansdale was known as Landslide Lansdale because of his success in the Philippines. And so it was in the summer of 1954 that Landslide Lansdale found himself in Saigon. And his marching orders from Alan Dulles were quite literally, do what you did in the Philippines. And he did. Uh, the, the first thing he did was to cultivate a new protege, just as he had cultivated Ramon Magsai Sai in the Philippines. He cultivated No Din's Yim, this Catholic Confucian Mandarin uh, who had just been appointed prime minister of the new state of South Vietnam. Ziem had previously been a minister under the French uh, and then had quit in disgust, and so he had credentials as both an anti-colonialist as well as an anti-communist. But when he was appointed prime minister in, in the summer of 1954, very few people imagined that he would last nine weeks, much less nine years. And the fact that he did owed a lot to the expert guidance that he received from Ed Lansdale. Lansdale immediately began to, to bond with them, and here is Lansdale, and there is Ziem. He faced some obstacles, including the language barrier, because even though Lansdale uh, had an unusual ability to win over foreigners, he was kind of a typical American in that he only spoke English. Now, this wasn't as much of a problem in the Philippines, where all of the elites spoke English. It was a much bigger problem in Vietnam, where the elites spoke French or Vietnamese. So he had to work through a translator. But even working through a translator, he still managed 
to forge a fast friendship with ZM. And how did he do it? Very simple. He listened rather than lectured. Now, when Americans go to the developing world, we love to tell people what to do. And that wasn't the Lansdale approach at all. He approached folks like ZM in a spirit of friendship, humility, and empathy. And most of all, he simply listened to what they had to say, which wasn't always easy to do because ZM was a notorious windbag uh, who would go on for hour after hour and bore the pants off of most of his American interlocutors. But Lansdale was made of sterner stuff and probably had a stronger bladder uh, because he would sit there and listen to him uh, very patiently. And at the end of that time, he would say, well, that's fascinating, Mr. Prime Minister. If I understand what you're saying, it's X, Y, and Z. And then he would rephrase what ZM had told him, putting across his own ideas and making ZM think that he thought of it himself. That's a pretty subtle but a pretty effective method of operating. I mean, try it for yourselves. It works with spouses. Uh, <laughs> it works with bosses. Uh, and it definitely works with foreign heads of state. So by winning uh, ZM's trust and confidence, Lansdale was able to implement his very ambitious pacification program for South Vietnam, including Operation Passage to Freedom, enlisting the US Navy to move 900,000 refugees from North Vietnam to South Vietnam, thereby greatly strengthening the state of South Vietnam. And of course, Lansdale being Lansdale, there had to be a psychological component to it, including hiring a soothsayer to predict bad fortune for North Vietnam and good fortune for South Vietnam. He also launched Operation Brotherhood, bringing over Filipino doctors and nurses to provide free medical care to the people of South Vietnam in order to win them over to the government. Now, the fact that a CIA man was doing all this stuff, and by this time, Lansdale was a Air Force colonel, but was on loan to the CIA. And the fact that a CIA man was doing all this was controversial within the US government. There were a lot of folks who didn't think that was really his job. And those folks included his own boss, uh, General Lightning Joe Collins, great hero of World War II, four-star general, army chief of staff, uh, friend of President Eisenhower, who had just been appointed ambassador uh, to the Philippines. And Lightning Joe Collins was a great conventional war general, but he did not have much understanding of unconventional conflict. And so he and Lansdale clashed at their very first country team meeting where uh, Collins came in and said that he was determined to reduce the size of the South Vietnamese army because it was costing too much. Well, Lansdale objected. He pointed out that the Viet Minh, the communists, were about to abandon large chunks of South Vietnamese territory and the army was the only part of the government that could actually do anything. So you needed to have the army to go in there to provide governmental services. And oh, by the way, there were also all these sect military forces running around that had to be demobilized and incorporated into the army. Otherwise, uh, you would not have a state. Well, Collins heard him out very briefly and then said, I am here as the personal representative of the President of the United States, Mr. and you're out of order. Have a seat. Well, at that point, most colonels uh, told to have it, a seat by a four-star general would, in fact, have a seat. Uh, but Lansdale was not your average colonel. He was, in fact, a maverick and a troublemaker. So rather than having a seat, he stood up and he said, well, sir, you may be here as the personal representative of the President of the United States. But I am convinced if the people of the United States could hear what you had to say, they would disagree with you. And on behalf of the people of the United States, I am here to speak up against what you just said. And on behalf of the people of the United States, in fact, I am walking out on you. And out he walked out the door. Now, don't try this at home. Uh, it's probably not going to end well for your career. Uh, the fact that uh, Lansdale got away with his insubordination owed a lot to the fact that he had protectors even more powerful than four-star generals, uh, because he had the, the patronage of the Dulles brothers, who were the true kingmakers in President Eisenhower's Washington. And that became of crucial importance in the spring of 1955 during the pivotal episode in ZM's consolidation of power, the Battle of Saigon, when with Lansdale's encouragement, he sent the South Vietnamese army into the streets of the capital to defeat these sect military forces uh, that were threatening his government. It was a fierce street battle, it was touch and go for a while. General Collins wanted to abandon ZM, but Lansdale went over his head to Allen Dulles in Washington and Dulles in turn went to President Eisenhower and overrode the ambassador and maintained American support for ZM. So with that support, uh, ZM and his army were able to defeat the sect military forces and consolidate his authority. By the end of 1956, when Lansdale was ready to go home, uh, ZM looked pretty well consolidated in power. And this is uh, ZM touring 
an area in the provinces that had been pacified at Lansdale's direction. By the end of 1956, Yum was seen much like Magsai Sai was seen as an important nationalist leader and anti-communist bulwark in Southeast Asia. And when Lansdale came home, uh, the select few people with the top level security clearances who knew what he had done uh, were suitably impressed. Here he is getting a medal from Vice President Nixon as his wife Helen looks on. Now by the end of the 1950s and the early 60s, Lansdale was becoming the least secret, secret agent on the planet. He was in fact becoming pretty darn famous. He was said to be the model for the quiet American and the ugly American. He was getting all sorts of nicknames like the T. Lawrence of Asia and the American James Bond. When the Kennedy administration came into power, they were pretty impressed uh, by Lansdale. So impressed, in fact, that they gave him uh, their top priority assignment. And what was their top priority assignment? It was overthrowing this man, Fidel Castro, who had embarrassed and humiliated uh, the United States and specifically the Kennedys uh, with the fiasco of the Bay of Pigs at the beginning of the Kennedy administration. The Kennedys were determined to exact revenge. They wanted to get rid of Castro. They didn't care how, kill him, overthrow him, whatever. They just wanted him gone. But they didn't trust the CIA, which had been responsible for the Bay of Pigs debacle, which Lansdale had opposed. So instead of turning to the agency, they turned to the American James Bond. And at the end of 1961, Lansdale was appointed operations director of Operation Mongoose, this interagency effort to overthrow or kill Fidel Castro. Well, Lansdale very quickly figured out that the only way he was going to overthrow Castro was with an American military invasion. But the Kennedys did not want to invade Cuba. What they wanted was some kind of covert action gimmick that would allow them to overthrow uh, Castro at scant risk to themselves. And so Lansdale spent much of 1962 trying to come up with that gimmick. The result was stuff like this. Uh, this is a CIA propaganda poster depicting Gusano Libra, free worm because Castro called his enemies worms, and so this was an attempt to play off of that and to make free worm the symbol of Cuban resistance. And this is free worm cutting power lines, sabotaging power lines in Cuba. Now you have to admit this was undoubtedly the cutest mascot that any insurgency has ever had, uh, but it wasn't very successful. The only thing that Mongoose really achieved was to generate the intelligence that allowed policymakers in Washington to figure out uh, that Nikita Khrushchev was placing nuclear missiles into Cuba. After the conclusion of the Cuban Missile Crisis in October of 1962, Mongoose was disbanded. Ed Lansdale lost the favor of the Kennedys, and he was left essentially defenseless before his many bureaucratic enemies, of whom the most important was his own boss, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. Two very different personalities. McNamara uh, had come to the Pentagon from running the Ford Motor Company, graduate of the Harvard Business School. In fairness, I should note he also graduate of my alma mater, UC Berkeley. Uh, he loved numbers, he loved systems analysis, he thought that these computer equations would, control, would, would, would contain the meaning of existence. Uh, Lansdale, not so bright academically, UCLA dropout, but he had spent years in Southeast Asia. And so when McNamara came into office, Lansdale tried to begin his education in this new warfare, uh, new, for, new war, uh, just beginning in Vietnam. Lansdale had just gone to South Vietnam and he came back with some souvenirs, some captured Viet Cong weaponry, some very simple uh, pistols and rifles and stakes and so forth, all covered in mud and blood. And he walked into McNamara's office and dumped this pile of weapons on McNamara's immaculate desk. And he said, Mr. Secretary, these are the weapons that are being used by our enemies in Vietnam. Uh, they're very primitive and the people who are using them, you wouldn't even recognize them as soldiers because they wear black pajamas and rubber sandals, they don't have uniforms. But in fact, they're looking the troops on our side because they have something uh, that we lack, which is the power of an ideal, the power of an idea. And the only way we're gonna defeat them is with a better ideal, a more powerful ideal. We're not going to bomb this revolution into oblivion. Now in hindsight, that seems like pretty wise advice but McNamara was invincibly armored in his ignorance and arrogance and refused to listen to what Ed Lansdale had to say. And so it was that Lansdale was entirely shut out of Vietnam policy by 1963, the year of the Buddhist crisis. When you had these militant Buddhists rising up against the Catholic ZM, you had Buddhist monks setting themselves on fire in the streets of Saigon. This is one of the most famous and influential photos ever taken. 
uh, because it convinced the Kennedy administration uh, that the only way to defeat communism in Vietnam was to back a military coup against Diem. Now Lansdale warned against this course of action. He said, I know Diem, I know he's imperfect, but I can work with him. Send me over there. Uh, he is the least bad alternative that we have. And Lansdale said, I also know the generals. I know they're going to be uh, far less legitimate, uh, far more corrupt, far less effective than uh, ZM has been. Uh, but he was ignored. And at the beginning of November 1963, on, coincidentally on the very same day when Lansdale was retired from the Pentagon as a two-star general, uh, the military coup against ZM went ahead within 24 hours no Din Ziem and his brother No Din Nu had been murdered. The consequences were every bit as catastrophic as Lansdale had predicted. The Viet Cong stepped up their infiltrations. South Vietnam uh, all but collapsed. You had military coup follow military coup. Uh, there was uh, uh, no chance of South Vietnam st uh, stopping this, this stepped up invasion. And by 1965, Lyndon Johnson concluded that the only way to save South Vietnam was to bomb North Vietnam and to send American combat troops into the South. This was a policy that Lansdale opposed. He wanted to save South Vietnam, but he thought that the South Vietnamese had to be on the front lines themselves, that Americans could be advisors and could provide aid, but they should not do the fighting for South Vietnam. Again, he was ignored. In 1965, Lansdale went back to Vietnam trying to salvage a situation that he already saw was spinning out of control. And this is him arriving in the tarmac in, in in Saigon uh, to work at the U.S. Embassy for Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge. Uh, this was not a, a, a good match to begin with because Henry Cabot Lodge had been the ambassador in 1963 who had overseen the overthrow and murder of Lansdale's friend, No Din Ziem. Now in the past, in the 1950s, Lansdale had no problem running roughshod over mere ambassadors, but he did not have the same kind of pull in the mid-1960s. His primary patron within the Johnson administration was Vice President Hubert Humphrey, uh, who was well-intentioned and like Lansdale, but also was almost powerless to affect LBJ's decision-making on Vietnam. Lansdale also tried to cultivate a local protege, as he had done with Mog Tsai Tsai and ZM. He tried to work with Win Cao Ki, this very flashy Air Force Vice Marshal, uh, who was Prime Minister and then later Vice President of South Vietnam, but Key lost a power struggle with Win Van Tu, this other general, an, Air, a, an army general, who emerged as the dominant strongman of the military junta. And so it was that in the mid-60s, Lansdale lacked both a powerful protector in Washington as well as a powerful patron on the ground in South Vietnam. He was essentially a spectator as the war careened along its conventional course with the search uh, and destroy missions, the free fire zones, the arc-like raids and all the rest of the horrors of, of, of war. General William Westmoreland imagined that he could kill the Viet Cong faster than they could be replaced. Lansdale warned this was an illusion. It was never going to work. The only way you were going to win was by standing up a stable, legitimate, and popular government in Saigon. But he was ignored until finally the Tet Offensive in 1968, 50 years ago, made it impossible to ignore Lansdale's warnings. Uh, Lansdale was not entirely surprised by the offensive, and he did not see it as this big victory for the United States, as General Westmoreland made it out to be. Lansdale understood that it was, in fact, a crippling psychological defeat, which destroyed American popular support for the war effort. He finally went home for the last time from Vietnam in the summer of 1968, feeling dejected, defeated, and demoralized. He was not terribly surprised a few years later, in the spring of 1975, when North Vietnam invaded and quickly conquered the husk of a state that was South Vietnam. Now the question that I raise in my book, the reason why it's called The Road Not Taken, is how would things have gone differently if Lansdale had been listened to? And I certainly can't stand here today and pretend that if Lansdale had in fact uh, been the dominant decision maker that we would have necessarily won the war because North Vietnam was going to be uh, a, a ferocious adversary under any circumstances with more will to win than we had. But at the very least, one thing I'm pretty sure of is that if Lansdale had been listened to, and even if we had lost, we would not have lost 58,000 Americans in Vietnam. We would not have had millions of Vietnamese killed in the crossfire because he never wanted to see this conventional big unit war in the first place. He was haunted to the end of his days by a sense of failure, the what-ifs, might-have-beens, 
his professional life, his legacy left in ashes. He did, however, find a measure of personal happiness after his first wife, Helen, died. Uh, Pat Kelly, still unmarried, had just retired from the US Information Agency in Manila. She moved uh, to the United States, and on July 4th of 1973, the two lovebirds finally got married. And this is them in the kitchen of their home in uh, Northern Virginia, where they lived happily ever after until Lansdale's demise from natural causes in 1987. And I must say uh, that having spent the last five years researching Ed Lansdale's life, it was quite a moving experience for me to visit his grave at Arlington National Cemetery. I felt like I really knew the guy in some ways better than I know my own father, which may be a commentary on my relationship with my father, uh, but is also a commentary on, on uh, the, the, the way that I plunged into this research on Ed Lansdale. And his story took directions I did not anticipate. I knew it was going to be a a story of the Vietnam War, but it also turned into an adventure story and a spy story, and most of all, a romance, which certainly the last thing a knuckle-dragging military historian like me ever expected to be writing was a romance, but I was actually quite touched by the relationship between Ed Lansdale and Pat Kelly, and that forms one of the major themes of the book. Final point that I would note is that I think there is some relevance here for the present day beyond the intrinsic interest in Ed Lansdale's life story, which was fascinating. Because today, of course, we are embarked on another great counterinsurgency. And this time, not against communist insurgents as in Lansdale's day, but against Islamist insurgents. And how are we going to win the war on terror? If, in fact, we do win the war on terror, I would submit we're probably not going to do it with American combat troops. We're not going to send huge numbers of soldiers to occupy the greater Middle East. Been there, done that, tried it, didn't like it, probably not going to do it again anytime soon. So if we're not going to win with American combat troops, how are we going to win if, in fact, we do win? I would submit with American advisors, with small teams of military, intelligence, and diplomatic personnel, dispatch these far-flung lands to help their governments defeat our common enemies, much in the way we did recently in the fight against ISIS. And if you think about advisors, you've got to think about Ed Lansdale, who was one of the most storied and successful advisors of the 20th century, right up there with T. Lawrence. I think he has a lot of lessons to teach, both good and bad. It's, it's not all positive. I mean, he didn't do everything right. He made a lot of mistakes. And I bring those out in the book as well. But I think there is a positive takeaway here, which is the way that he used empathy as a weapon of war, the way that he sent emotional intelligence marching in the battle, uh, the way that he was able to forge these bonds with foreign leaders and to make them instruments of US policy, but also uh, in, in a way that also served the interests of their own people. And I think that's a lesson that we can think about as we think about the strategic challenges of the 21st century. So with that, um, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer questions or, or take comments. Well, thank you. Let me exercise my uh, privilege as moderator and ask a few questions, and then uh, we can go to the, uh, uh, to the floor. But um, my first question is the one that we discussed a little in my office before we came down, which is uh, how do you get Americans to develop that deep understanding of a foreign culture? Lansdale was in the Philippines for seven years. I think he was in Vietnam for five. Uh, when we look at our experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, there are very few people who spent that kind of time there. We mentioned, you know, Carter Malkazian, but you know, after that, it's 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 hard to think of somebody. And, and I mean, first. You know, are we overlooking somebody who maybe um, uh, did, did develop that kind of expertise? And had, I mean, how, how do you do that? It's very hard with our personnel system, uh, which really seems designed to sabotage people like Ed Lansdale. I mean, it wasn't so easy in his day. As, as I noted, he had constant battles with bureaucratic rivals, and he made a lot of enemies. Uh, and he was a basically able to be effective when he had top-level champions in Washington, like the Dulles brothers. And so he was able to operate outside of the normal bureaucratic structures. He wasn't a career CIA officer. He was ostensibly a, and in fact, he was an Air Force officer, but he had almost nothing to do with the Air Force. He didn't believe in air power, and he didn't serve in Air Force units. So he was kind of a unique lone operator. Uh, very hard to do that, obviously, especially if, and to have the kind of career success that he had becoming a two-star general. Uh, you know, our whole personnel system, as I'm sure all of you know, is really designed to rotate people all the time, uh, whether in the military, 
uh, intelligence or, or the State Department to create a core of generalists. And it makes it very hard to have the kind of in-depth local knowledge that Lansdale acquired. But I think it's essential that we think about how we can create niches for people like this, because I think we've really suffered from not having had Lansdales. I mean, if you think about what's happened in Iraq and Afghanistan, we became crosswise with our local allies, Hamid Karzai and Nuri al-Maliki, much in the same way as, as we had become at odds with ZM in the early 1960s, and that made it impossible to achieve our objectives. And part of the problem was that we did not have consistent, trusted interlocutors, Americans uh, who had won the, the confidence of these foreign leaders. In the case of Karzai, we maybe had that for a short while when Zal Khalilzad was the ambassador out there, but then he left, and that role was not really replaced. And so I think we could really use people like Lansdale, who spend time in these countries and develop these long-term relationships with local leaders. I think that's a very powerful instrument of American foreign policy that we're not really utilizing. Do you think that the State Department and the intelligence community do a better job on this? Uh, the, the military personnel system, certainly with its upper route, its generalist outlook, uh, the rapid rotations is not well suited for developing this kind of expertise. There may be a little bit more flexibility in, in the IC and in the, in the State Department, but they also have that uh, rotational imperative and uh, there are limits on how long they can, they, can stand, they can stay in one area. And I mean, realistically, I mean, if you think about people like Ed Lansdale or John Paul Van and others who were these mavericks who did in fact stay in these countries for a long time, they essentially developed, you know, second families or, you know, other attachments, certainly with, with local women. Uh, they were estranged from their families. Uh, and so there, you know, there's a, there's a personal cost and there's a bureaucratic cost. They became estranged from their bureaucracy. So it really takes people who are, uh, you know, comfortable operating as, as these kinds of lone wolf operatives. And then the question becomes, even if they're able to do that and acquire this local knowledge, as, as some people are, how do they then take that back to Washington? How are they able to influence uh, the decision making in this town? Because it's not much use if you know this stuff, but you can't get anybody in a position of power to listen to you. And that was essentially uh, the dilemma that Lansdale faced in the 1960s. Well, I was just over there today. It seems like it still exists, but it has. there is no question that it has been uh, degraded under uh, the leadership of Secretary Tillerson and President Trump, where they're losing an entire generation of Foreign Service officers. They didn't have much capacity to begin with, and they have even less capacity today. So, you know, I, I've also done a tour of, of military installations at places like the Army War College and Fort Benning and so forth, and the advice that I've given the, the younger officers there when they've asked for it is my advice has been, you gotta do politics. You can't take the uh, you know, you can't take the traditional military mindset that we just do uh, kinetic military operations and somebody else has to do the political end of things because if you're looking around for somebody else to do the politics, uh, you're going to be waiting a long time. Uh, so when you're in these countries, you have to think not only militarily but also politically in terms of the political impact you're having and how you can shape the politics of the local society. And one of the points that Lansdale made in his arguments with the U.S. military, and he had a lot of them, especially in the 60s, was that the U.S. military has a tremendous political impact wherever it goes, but usually it's completely mindless in its political impact. It doesn't understand how it's affecting local society. And so his, uh, his plea was that the military should realize the huge impact it has on local society and try to manage that in a constructive rather than destructive direction. Looking at the Philippines, well, first I see some people standing. You're, you're welcome to sit down. Uh, you're making me nervous there. Right? Although I like the idea of a standing room only on yeah, crowd. Yeah. Um, looking at the Philippines, you certainly have Lansdale, who's sui generis, and, uh, but you also have Megsese, who's quite unusual. I mean, was, was the success there the result of just two very unusual personalities, or is this more generalizable, you know, maybe not in this kind of ideal combination where you have this you know, American advertising agent combined with a, a true reformer and fairly skilled politician, um, uh, and certainly a, a, a credible military officer uh, on the other side. Well, Mag Tsai Tsai was certainly an unusual character, and it's one of the great roads not taken in, in, in the history of the Philippines. What would have happened uh, 
if he had not died prematurely in an airplane crash in 1957, how might the history of the Philippines have been different because he was uh, probably the greatest uh, president in, in the history of the Philippines. Uh, and so Lansdale, you know, had, had a real partner. But remember, uh, Mark Saisai was not president of the Philippines when Lansdale went out there on his second tour in 1950. Mark Saisai became president in no small part because of the machinations of Ed Lansdale. So he actually pr helped to promote Mark Saisai to a higher level position. And there, but, you know, there's no question that they had this symbiotic relationship where the fact that Mark Saisai was this skilled politician, a friendly, outgoing guy, uh, that was tremendously useful and very different from ZM, who was this reclusive, scholarly Mandarin who was certainly no man of the people and had much more autocratic and dictatorial instincts. Uh, so I, I think it is tremendously helpful uh, if you can have, and, and probably essential to have good local leaders, but you can also try to, uh, to, to cultivate those leaders. And even if you have leaders who are imperfect, you can still work with them and try to push them along the right path, as Lansdale did in the case of ZM. Uh, and, you know, recently we've had another example of, of a kind of a Lansdale-like approach paying off big time, which was in Colombia, in large part, I would say, because President Uribe was a Mao Tse-like leader who was very effective, mobilized the country to wage an effective counterinsurgency, and we provided help with Plan Colombia, with advisors, with aid, but we didn't take over the war, we didn't Americanize it, and now it's resulted finally uh, in, the, in the peace treaty, which Uribe ironically opposes the peace treaty with FARC, which has led FARC to lay down their arms. But also remember that they finally laid down their arms after 50 years. So even in the best case scenario, uh, these things tend to be long run affairs. Let me ask one last question and then we'll uh, open it up. And that is John Paul Van, who has also been held up as you know, an alternative approach. You know, he had you know, bright shining lie, uh, written about him. I guess they actually met uh, a couple of times um, uh, early on. I mean, what do you think about you know the the historiography around John Paul Van, uh, which is mostly written by seems to me you know the the, the New York Times wing of the uh, uh, Vietnam history um, um, community? Well, I think the. You know, the historiography on John Paul Van is almost pretty much entirely the work of Neil Sheehan, uh, who wrote a tremendous book, A Bright Shining Lie, uh, but I'm not sure that I agree with the thrust of it. I mean, I think he did a beautiful job of portraying John Paul Van's life, and he found out a lot of things that nobody knew about Van, including the fact that he was drummed out of the army on statutory rape charges and all these scandals in his personal life, but he somehow tried to make the fact that, you know, Van was a very flawed, individual who mythologized his own life, he tried to make that into a metaphor for the entire U.S. war effort in Vietnam, and I'm not sure that entirely holds together. I mean, Van was an interesting and quirky figure. Lansdale knew him, uh, and in fact, Lansdale introduced him uh, to his best friend, uh, Dan Ellsberg, uh, the future Pentagon Papers leaker who went out to Vietnam in 1965 uh, to work for uh, Ed Lansdale. And kind of interesting, I actually talked to Dan Ellsberg in the course of writing my book, and he told me that he loved uh, Ed Lansdale and loves him still. He greatly respected him, and all the Lansdale was not very happy with the leak of the Pentagon Papers, because a lot of the Pentagon Papers concerned Ed Lansdale and his activities in Vietnam in the 1950s. Nevertheless, they maintained their relationship. But John Paul Van and, and Ed Lansdale were kind of, a, there, there were a lot of differences, but they were kind of similar in that neither man kind of fit neatly on the hawk-dove spectrum because they were certainly not hawks in that they didn't believe that more conventional firepower was going to win the war, which was the consensus among the conventional generals, uh, but nor were they doves in that they didn't believe in abandoning South Vietnam either. Of course, Dan Ellsberg went from being super hawk to being super dove, and Lansdale and Van were kind of outliers, neither, neither hawk nor dove occupying kind of an uneasy and isolated position on the political spectrum. Great. Okay, I think we can open it up for uh, questions. We have a microphone coming around. Sure, right, right, right there. Uh, thank you for your talk. My name is Eric Villard. I'm from the Army Center of Military History uh, in the Vietnam War. Been here a few Welcome times. Back. Thank you. Um, so my question is about at what point 
um, t n not taking the road where the, the road forks? Is there a point where it's almost too late? Because I kind of see maybe 1959 is sort of the point where it's it's too late because by that point North Vietnam decides it's going to uh, commit itself towards supporting the armed insurgency in the South and and once you make that decision you're going towards conventional war there's there's no stopping it so it seems like the window for Lansdale to do his thing might have been 54 to 56 57 after that things just kind of become uh, too big and, and are out of his control, and certainly by 63. Um, it's hard to see how he could have, even if he'd been listened to, would have been able to stop that train. Just your thoughts on that. Well, I, in the book, I posit that the, that, that the pivot point, the turning point, was the anti-ZM coup in November of 1963, uh, because up until then, uh, there was a tenuous stability in South Vietnam and there were some effective counterinsurgency programs like the strategic hamlets and all of that fell apart as soon as ZM was overthrown and you had you know military coup following military coup and that was the point where uh, South Vietnam I believe was fatally destabilized and the war was Americanized because having overthrown the government of South Vietnam we basically took ownership of the fate of South Vietnam and so it was a very short line from the overthrow of ZM to the commitment of half a million American troops and certainly by the mid-1960s, as you had this big unit war going on uh, with uh, major U.S. Army and Marine units clashing with major NVA uh, Army of North Vietnam units, uh, you had this massive civilian and military bureaucracy, and Ed Lansdale and his small team of a dozen or so operatives was sidelined and seen as, as being irrelevant. But even there, I think, when when they were the least consequential. I think Lansdale still had some insights worth pondering because he was very exercised in the 1960s about the state of uh, South Vietnam and about its army, the ARVIN, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, uh, which both the state and the army were plagued by many of the same issues of corruption, factionalism, sectarianism, favoritism, et cetera, that have more recently plagued uh, the government and military forces in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. And Lansdale wanted to promote reformers as generals, uh, honest generals who wanted to clean up the military and make it more professional. He wanted to push for uh, free and fair elections uh, that would make the government more accountable to the people and lead hopefully to the emergence of more legitimate leaders than the military dictators. But in all of this, he was entirely ignored uh, by the powers that be President Johnson, Secretary McNamara, General Westmoreland, and others had no interest in this political action because they thought they were just going to use massive American firepower to wipe out the insurgency. And Lansdale understood that wasn't going to be the case, that the firepower approach was not going to work. He knew the math didn't add up. I mean, reading his letters, uh, he couldn't understand how these body counts made any sense because he said, you know, uh, you know he, he reads these amazing body counts generated by Mac V. Uh, Military Assistance Command Vietnam, uh, and yet at the end of the year, the CIA assessment is that there is more uh, communist fighters in South Vietnam than there were at the beginning of the year, so what the hell is the point of the body counts? He was saying that from the very beginning, and he understood that the only way that South Vietnam was ultimately gonna survive was not with American firepower, but with a government that could command the allegiance of its own people, and he thought it was imperative to foster that. But again, he was completely ignored, and uh, you know, I think the, uh, the consequences of, of the trends that he saw, I think, became clear in the early 1970s when we withdrew most of our, and finally all of our military personnel, and South Vietnam was just not strong enough to stand on its own. Okay, yeah, down here in front. Hi, my name is Max Bone, and I'm a student at uh, George Washington. Uh, you talked about the friendship that he made with the leaders of Vietnam and how he used that in order to combat the insurgents. But today, in a majority of places where we're struggling with terrorism, the leaders of the countries are part of the reason that people are prone to terrorism. Uh, 
So what would be the way to approach it there? For example, in the Sahel, it would make the U.S. look bad by cozying up with these leaders who are not very well regarded by the people, but at the same time, we can't cozy up with the Islamists. So what's, what would be the way that you would see that we could approach situations where neither side is good? Well, certainly there are going to be cases where you have uh, very toxic leaders and uh, may not be suitable partners. So I, I don't by any stretch suggest that the Lansdale approach can work in every case. But I think there's a, there's a huge gray zone of leaders who may not be the reincarnation of George Washington, but aren't necessarily Adolf Hitler Jr. either. I think there's a vast gray space in between there. And I would say that people like Karzai occupy that gray space because I think, for example, Karzai was not necessarily an evil guy. Uh, he just reacted to the incentives of the system. And I think he could have gone in various directions. Uh, but because we did not nurture and support him, he basically uh, took uh, Secretary Don Rumsfeld's advice and, and tried to consolidate his rule Chicago style uh, by making deals with uh, repugnant warlords who abused their authority, uh, victimized the people, and thereby uh, created more recruits for the Taliban. And you wonder if how things might have been gone differently, for example, in that case, if we had had somebody w like an Ed Lansdale with Karzai for the long term, really working with him, advising him, and helping him uh, to rule in a more consensual and less corrupt fashion uh, in a way that would win greater uh, legitimacy for his regime. I think that's, that's kind of a road not taken uh, in the case of Afghanistan and other countries. But uh, again, I, I will be the first to admit that this is not possible in every case. I mean, sometimes you have leaders who are just vile and hopelessly corrupt and so forth, and, and then you kind of throw up your hands in despair. What would you classify as What? Can you think of a modern Well, I mean, there's, I mean, there's a lot of bad leaders. I mean, uh, you know, it's very hard to make this approach work in a place like Syria, for example, which uh, is just a god awful mess, uh, and it's very hard to know how you foster, uh, you know, any kind of legitimate government there. You, it's certainly hard to imagine working with somebody like Bashar Assad, uh, who is a, a pretty evil guy. Uh, I mean, there's, I mean, I'm sure there's many other examples of. Uh, uh, you know, repugnant regimes you can point to. Uh, but again, I think there's, there's, there's a number of other regimes like, for example, uh, Ashraf Ghani in Afghanistan or, or Abadi in Iraq who are not bad guys. I think people we can work with, we, we can nurture them and try to move them along the right path. Okay. Did you have a question? Maybe? Yeah. In the course of your research, uh, what is your take on Mark Moyer's book on Vietnam and also Jeffrey Shaw's recent bio of ZM saying ZM was the only book the place had? Uh, well, I, I mean, I read Mark's book years ago. I, as I recall, I did not agree with him on, on uh, everything that he had to argue. I mean, he threw out a lot of provocative arguments, which I think uh, would cause one to uh, to to think hard about some of the conventional wisdom about uh, Vietnam. I, I mean, again, it wasn't all convincing to me, but it was. You know, I think he made uh, some uh, uh, some some interesting arguments that sparked debate, and I think that's all for the best. Um, I'm not familiar with the with the with the book on ZM that you referenced, but I think there has been from the historiography that I've seen. I think there has been some reassessment of ZM. Uh, and I think some of the conventional wisdom about him is uh, doesn't really add up because if you, for example, watch uh, the Ken Burns uh, PBS documentary on Vietnam, it presents the it presents the conventional view, you know, with interviews with Neil Sheehan and others about how ZM lost the support of his people in 1963 and how he was a hopeless, out of touch ruler and all the rest of it. Kind of the the same reasons why the Kennedy administration overthrew him, but. And then in the next minute, it's talking about how awful everything became after ZM was overthrown. And, but nobody ever paused and said, wait a second, if ZM was so bad, how come after he was overthrown, the situation got worse and not better? Uh, and I think that should cause some reassessment and, and make us realize that uh, the people who succeeded ZM were actually worse. And so suggesting that ZM was, was not, perhaps not quite as bad uh, as he was made out to be.
Is there a conclusion, if not a premise, from your work that the war was America's to lose and that it was not an overdetermined situation in which there was no card the U.S. could have held to come out on top? Well, as I suggested, I, I certainly did not write in the book that the war was America's to lose. Uh, I, what I suggested is it wasn't inevitable that we would lose the war and lose 58,000 troops and have millions of Vietnamese uh, killed in the crossfire. I think there were other possibilities. There was a chance that uh, perhaps South Vietnam could have been safeguarded and, and could still exist to this day and be kind of an Asian tiger economy, much like South Korea or Taiwan. Uh, but you, but I, I don't certainly write in the book that if only Lansdale had been listened to, that would have been the inevitable outcome. What I suggest, as I suggested in my presentation, is that at the very least, if he had been listened to, he would not have lost 58,000 Americans. We would not have had this massive uh, conventional conflict. And so I, I try to make a fairly modest and I think tenable claim, uh, but uh, you know, I think it's hard to argue in retrospect that, that the path we chose was the right one. I think there, were, there are others that we should have thought about. And I'm, you know, the conventional uh, kind of conservative slash military conventional wisdom was that the problem in Vietnam was that we fought with one hand tied behind our back if only we had bombed North Vietnam into the Stone Age, as uh, General Curtis LeMay so memorably said, uh, if we'd invaded North Vietnam, if we'd used more force, we could have prevailed. I don't really buy that uh, because, in fact, we dropped more bombs than we had uh, during World War II. Uh, and using, there's nothing to indicate that using more force would have led us to prevail, even if we'd occupied North Vietnam. Remember, the French actually occupied North Vietnam, too, and they still lost the guerrilla war against an insurgency with secure supply lines running into China. So uh, I don't really buy this notion that uh, this hawkish uh, conceit that we should have used more force to win. Uh, and I think that there is something to be, I think, more plausible as the kind of Ed Lansdale, John Paul Van notion that if we'd actually applied counterinsurgency 101, uh, we could have had more success. But even then, as I suggested, I'm not saying that we would have necessarily won at but at least we would have lost at lower cost. Okay. When I'm Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant. Uh, actually, uh, just a quick comment, but they had the uh, meeting on the 50th anniversary of a Tet Offensive here just several weeks ago, and the, the French scholar who spends a lot of time in the archives there uh, in North Vietnam, you know, going over what uh, went, <laughs> said that it's so frustrating because when he talks to the young people in North Vietnam today, they, they say to him, oh, I just wish the Americans had won the war because then we would be where the South Koreans are today. <laughs> and, you know, just so farther ahead economically. So he was kind of upset about that, but maybe there's a point there. Uh, so the question is, um, Really, your suggestion was, uh, um, you know, that maybe the, the alternative, or perhaps uh, the Lansdale alternative, is you know, small, uh, smaller groups, maybe special uh, forces type groups, you know, advising uh, countries. Uh, certainly, that's uh, something people consider. Uh, but actually, is there any evidence that that that, that works any better? I mean, you know, I mean, you're saying, that, well, the, the massive military force doesn't work. But I'm, I can not see that you actually got an argument for it. And secondly, to say that Lansdale was the uh, sort of originator of the counterinsurgency doctrine, what most people say is it's, a, the, you know, it's a French-Algerian guy that the U.S. Army quoted for the next 50 years as being the, the, the founder of uh, counterinsurgency therapy, that, a, a theory that they were following. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, uh, they lost the war despite that guy. So. So I, think, I think you're referring to David Galula, right. who was a French officer who wrote a book called Counterinsurgency in the early 1950s. And again, he was somebody that Lansdale was friendly with. Uh, but of course, his book did not describe what the French actually did in Algeria and Vietnam. It was basically what they should have done. Uh, and Lansdale, when he visited Vietnam in 1953, very immediately uh, surmised the fatal flaw in the French war effort, uh, which was that there was no political end state that the people could possibly support because the French were fighting uh, to maintain their colonial empire and that was never going to be tenable and he was determined that we not Americanize the war, that we not feed into 
this nationalist resentment, and we made clear that we were fighting uh, for the freedom of the people of South Vietnam and not to establish colonial rule over them. That was, that was a, a major distinction. And of course, counterinsurgency is a broad enough idea that it doesn't only have one author, uh, but there is no doubt that Lansdale was, was one of the originators of modern counterinsurgency doctrine in, in, in the Philippines in the early 1950s when he was working along doing very similar things to what uh, the, the British Field Marshal uh, Templar was doing in Malaya at the same time. And they uh, both were focusing on using less force and trying to forge a political solution. They didn't really have much contact, but they came up with a lot of these ideas independently at the same time. The reason why uh, Galula has been generally cited more than Lansdale is because Galula wrote a very short book that very crisply stated all these lessons and it became very influential, whereas Lansdale, uh, unlike Galula or T. Lawrence or some others, did not leave a compelling written record of his exploits or his methods. Uh, he did write a memoir in 1971 in the midst of wars, but it was intentionally unrevealing. He didn't want to come clean about his work for the CIA, his, his life with Pat Kelly, or a lot of other things, and he ended the narrative at the end of 1956, uh, because that was basically when the going was good. Uh, and so one of my hopes is that with this book that I will restore Lansdale to the position of prominence that he once occupied and that people will have a written record to figure out how he operated and, and to draw some lessons from that in the way that they have from Kalula and Lawrence and, and various others. Okay, one right back there, last question. Yes. The, um, uh, microphone coming. Oh, certainly. The, the question I have is, uh, did Lansdale accept uh, domino theory or did he view these conflicts as local even if they had a communist element to them and, he, and, and also nationalist. Uh, he generally bought into the domino theory, the, the, the dominant uh, foreign policy construct of the time, the notion that if the communists would take one country that other countries would soon follow. And of course that's been, uh, that's often derided in hindsight and it was, it's easy to say that it was exaggerated, but I mean remember that when Vietnam fell in 1975, Laos and Cambodia also fell. In Cambodia, you had the killing fields and several million people killed. Uh, interestingly enough, Lee Kuan Yew later said uh, that more countries would have fallen to communism if it had not been for the American war effort in Vietnam, which gave other states in Southeast Asia time to stabilize their internal situations. I mean, who knows? Uh, I would say that the domino theory wasn't entirely crazy, and people and, and policymakers in Washington were also not wrong to see Ho Chi Minh as fundamentally a communist rather than a liberal democrat as, as, as he was sometimes made out to be. He was a common turn operative, had lived in Moscow during the Stalin years and so forth. I think the big intellectual failing was the failure to see that communism was not monolithic. And I think there was an erroneous assumption that if the communists took power in Vietnam, they would be taking orders from Moscow and Beijing. And in fact, of course, as we know, pretty much the first thing that happened as soon as the communists prevailed in Vietnam was they wound up going to war with their former patrons in communist China. And so I think uh, policymakers in the 50s and 60s greatly underestimated the nationalist dimension of these various communist movements and imagined that it was all one big conspiracy, which it was not. That didn't change the fact that the individual communist movements were themselves uh, morally repugnant and repressive movements, but they weren't quite this monolithic threat uh, to the United States and the free world that was imagined at the time. Well, thank you very much for coming, and thank please you. join me in, in thanking Mr. Boot for his time. Future events uh, uh, with our project here on military and, and diplomatic history. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I have one, one more question.